So on March 2nd of this year, uh, we celebrated a Christian holiday called Ash Wednesday, and many of you participated in a service we had right here in our sanctuary. Uh, some of y'all participated online, and, and we did that service to really kick off the season of Lent. And we're in the middle of Lent right now, these 40 days that lead us to Easter. So during the service, we had a station here and a station over here, and you all came forward, and many of you received the sign of the cross on your forehead in ashes. And do you remember what we said to you when you came forward? We said, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust. Lent is a reminder to us about our humanity, our mortality, our need for God's grace and God's life. Remember that you are dust. Some traditions take it a bit further and say it a bit more bluntly, and they say, remember that you are going to die. <laughs> it's a bit morbid, you may think, but it is the truth. Lent is a reminder that our bodies will not live forever, that life is indeed fragile and often way too short. There is one thing that we all know for sure, and that is that we are all going to die. You know, in our culture here in America and other places throughout our world, we, we don't like to think about dying very much, do we? <laughs> we want to believe that we will live forever, that we are invincible. We like to believe that human ingenuity and expertise can overcome virtually anything. You know, Americans have believed that really our country is so mighty and so strong that nothing can ever shake us. I grew up in the 90s, and in the 90s in many ways I think was a decade of denial. Those of us with some privilege trying to believe that everything was great and that nothing could shake us. Uh, we, we've kind of had some wake-up calls in the last 20 years, right? Uh, and we don't necessarily believe that anymore. 9-11... 2001, I remember where I was when that happened. Many of you probably do as well. We've had natural disasters, countless documented cases of police violence, decades of war, a two-year-long pandemic that has taken close to a million lives just here in the United States. Now we're seeing this violent invasion of Ukraine playing out on our screens and social media feeds. Life is so, so fragile, isn't it? The title for my message this morning I borrowed from a, a guy named Matt Skinner, and I just love the way he put this. He said, life's fragility demands urgency. Life's fragility demands urgency. The fragile nature of life demands this seriousness and this urgency to the way that we live. Our text for today comes from Luke's Gospel. While Jesus is on his journey to Jerusalem, Jesus has just pointed out to his listeners that they do not know how to interpret the present time. They cannot read the signs of the times, he says to them. In response, these folks come to Jesus to talk with him about two current events. Perhaps they're trying to interpret them and understand these events. We can understand this. You, you don't know how many people have come to me during the pandemic and said, you know, this is in the Bible, right? You know, saying like they're trying to interpret what's happening and make sense of what's going on around us. They were doing it back then as well. And these two people come to Jesus trying to understand what's going on and interpret the present time. So they're talking about two events. I'm going to read Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. This is another one of those texts that the lectionary has brought forth to me, and I probably would have never chose to preach on it on my own, but here we are, and I'm really excited because I am really connecting with this message for today. So, Jesus had just been talking about this apocalyptic moment. He's talking about the end times. He's telling them, y'all have no idea how to interpret what's going on right now, and here's what happens after it. Now, there was some present at the time, at that time, who Jesus told 
about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, he said, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So let me break this down just for a moment. So some people were there with Jesus, and they were talking with him about two current events, these two tragedies that struck the Jews. Now, one of them was an act of state-sanctioned violence, and the other one was a construction accident that happened in Jerusalem. Both of these events were unexpected, they were tragic, and incredibly heartbreaking and sad. Now, there is no historical record that these events happened, yet there is no reason to doubt that they happened. The first event involved Pilate and some Galilean Jews. Now, we talked about Herod last week. Pilate, like Herod, was a leader installed by the Romans who was very brutal. He had little respect for the Jews, and he often treated them awful. He was violent, and he had no problem using violence to achieve his goals. The Galileans were Jews, and they were from that area up around the Sea of Galilee, kind of in the northern part of their nation. Jesus was a Galilean, all right? That's important to know. Galileans were often viewed sometimes viewed by other Jews as less than. They were from more rural areas, smaller towns, probably had less resources, and they often weren't considered as refined or high class as the Jews, say, from Jerusalem, for example. Things haven't changed a lot today, right? We still have these same views of other people here in Kentucky. Folks often view those from Appalachia and other places as less than, maybe not as refined, same thing was going on back then. In the Galilean wilderness, um, there was often talk of uprising. There was talk of revolution. Um, we talked about this last week, that there were lots of Galilean Jews who were gathering together, talking about how they could violently overthrow the Roman government who was occupying their land. All we know from this text is that Pilate brutally murdered a group of these Galilean Jews who were in Jerusalem, likely on pilgrimage. And he didn't just kill them. It says that he mixed their blood with the blood of their sacrifices in the temple. Now that sounds really brutal, right? It could mean that he literally took their blood and mixed it with the, the blood from the animals that were being sacrificed. It could mean that he just killed them in the temple. Um, and that's a way to talk about that. Either way, this is a very awful thing to do in a profound violation of the Jewish law and the Jewish faith. That he didn't just kill them. He tried to humiliate them in such a profound way. There is a strong possibility that perhaps these Galileans um, had staged some kind of uprising against the Roman authorities. And so this would indicate that maybe their murder was retribution for their crime of sedition against the state. I want you all to remember that Jesus was a Galilean. These were his people. And so when Jesus is commenting on this event, it's not as some detached observer. He's commenting on it as someone who would have been deeply impacted by this, right? He may have known uh, these people, potentially. Um, he, could, he was impacted on a personal level. So some Jews that Jesus was speaking with in this moment, um, presumably, we, we could say they might have been Judeans. They probably weren't Galileans. They approached Jesus, and they, they were talking with him about this particular tragedy. And, and they likely wondered what happened. Were these Galileans worse sinners than all the other Galileans? And is this why they suffered so much? Jesus emphatically responded to his own question, no, they were not worse sinners than all the other Galileans. 
So then Jesus brings up another event, and he asks the people about a construction accident in Jerusalem. Now, apparently a tower near the temple had fallen, and it killed 18 Jews from Jerusalem. Right? Things like this happen in our world today. These are awful tragedies, and we're often just like, oh, this is so senseless and awful. Why did this have to happen? And Jesus asked them, he says, do you think that, that these Jews from Jerusalem were more guilty or more sinful than other Jews in Jerusalem? Is that why the tower fell on them? And then he responds to his own question, no, no, that is not the case. You know, I want to bring this into the modern world just a bit. You know, one occurring pattern we see in our world, let's take the example of police violence, for instance, something we've talked about here some. We see this pattern emerge after cases of police violence that what will often happen is immediately there are individuals and groups that start to try to dig up dirt on the people who were killed in these situations, trying to find reasons why they may have deserved to die. Perhaps they were worse sinners than the others, they say. And that's why they deserve to be killed. Jesus flat out rejects this way of thinking in these verses. I remember after the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina um, years ago down in New Orleans. And there were pastors and Christian leaders. And they've done this many times before. And they've continued to do it after. And they tried to explain that tragedy by arguing that God was judging the people of New Orleans for their sinfulness, as if they were more sinful than other people throughout other parts of the nation. And that's why the hurricane hit there. Jesus rejects this way of thinking. You know, I wish Jesus, though, had said a little bit more. I wish he had taken his response just a bit further, because we are touching on, like, profound issues of why bad things happen in our world, right? And, and we're not going to answer that question today because Jesus does not answer that question in this passage. I wish he had taken it a step further and explained why tragedies happen, but he doesn't do that. He only tells us one reason why they didn't happen. He's just telling you, you can't use this as your justification for why the tragedy happened. He says that it wasn't the victim's sinfulness. He does not blame the victim's for these tragedies. And then what he says after is really surprising to me. He says two times, unless you repent, you too are all going to perish like them. So he turns the attention away from the tragedy, from the victims, from the questions of why, and he turns the attention towards all of us who are still living. And the call to us who are still living is repent. These two tragedies, one of state-sanctioned violence and the other a terrible accident, they remind us of life's fragility, right? Life is fragile. Our lives can end in a moment's notice without any warning. And life's fragility, according to Jesus, demands urgency. Repentance is a powerful concept that I think we desperately need to recover in the church today. I think we have sterilized it and we have kind of made repentance lose its power in most of our churches. I think in many ways the Christian church in America is stunted and it is struggling because we haven't taken Jesus' call to repentance very seriously. Repentance is more than just feeling sorry. It is more than apologizing. It is even more than just trying to change your behavior. Repentance is really a complete transformation of the mind. It is a new way of seeing that leads us to live differently in the world. It is honestly looking at ourselves, looking at others, seeing shortcomings, seeing strengths. It's a willingness to do that long, hard work of transformation. Repentance is not a one-time thing. It is a commitment to walk in a different direction and, be, and let God consume you and change you from the inside out. I think we've settled for an easy repentance, which is, in fact, no repentance at all. Jim Wallace uh, wrote a book um, about America's original sin, he called it, and it was about the sin of racism. 
And I just want to use this as an example for us because I think it can help us see the difference between this kind of powerless repentance and a repentance that actually could lead to change and transformation and potentially revival among our churches in America. You know, racism was there at the founding of our nation, and, and it's absurd to think that we don't need to learn about this and we don't need to invest in this and study this stuff and all this kind of fight to take this stuff out of our schools is just absurd to me because this is part of our story and we need to own it, right? And the church was so wrapped up in it. The church was all woven up into all this racism that was embedded into our systems, into our structures, and woven into our consciousness as a people. And, and what, has, what happens is that too many, and I'm speaking because I'm a white Christian myself, too many white Christians feel bad about the reality of racism. Most people don't want racism. Yet very few white Christians have been willing to do that deep, long, difficult work of repentance. You know, the public lynching of George Floyd. Awful, awful tragedy. And it woke many people up, right? A lot of people woke up to see things they'd not seen before. Many people woke up to the fragility and the injustice that black Americans deal with each and every day of their lives. And what happened is life's fragility demanded urgency for many people. And many white people started to ask a lot of hard questions, look inward, and even start to make changes to the way they were living. Many began the work of repentance. However, the urgency, from what I've gathered, has faded for most. <laughs> repentance is not a quick fix. It is not a public apology. It is not feeling bad for a few days or weeks or months or even years. Repentance is about a new mindset, a new perspective, and a commitment to doing better and repairing damage that has been done. And it is a long commitment. It is a commitment to allowing God to consume us and transform us and help us to see differently. And this is what the Gospels are all about. Jesus says those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, he's talking about a complete transformation of who we are, a different way of being in this world. And that's not going to happen quickly. Matt Skinner reflects on this passage with some profound insight. And he speaks to another natural disaster that happened in Haiti in 2010. And he says, in the aftermath of natural disasters, like the earthquake in Haiti in January 2010, it bears repeating that Jesus does not explain the causes of violence that nature and human beings regularly inflict upon unsuspecting people. He does not blame victims. He does not attempt to defend creation or the creator when why questions seem warranted. At least in this scene, he offers no theological speculation and inflicts no emotional abuse. He asks with an urgency fueled by raw memories of blood and rubble on the ground, what about you? How will you live the life you get to live? I love that last line. He asks with an urgency fueled by raw memories of blood and rubble on the ground, what about you? How will you live the life that you get to live? We are facing tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. We could keep going, right? We all know too well that life is so, so fragile. I was talking with one of my best friends recently, and he was reflecting on the tornado that hit western Kentucky, and he was torn up by the fact that some people went to bed that night and didn't wake up the next day to see the new day. And that awful tragedy challenged him to take his life more seriously, to love more, to ask questions about what's important, to focus on what matters to him. For him, life's fragility, it demanded urgency. You know, at the end of 2020, uh, many of us read a book together uh, by the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who had just passed away recently. And it was a book called The Book of Joy. And it was a really, we needed, we needed to read a book like that at the end of 2020 after such a hard year. In the back of the book, there is a selection of spiritual exercises that they put in there that meant to help us in our faith and ultimately help us have more joy in our lives. And I was talking with um, Dustin uh, last week, and he brought this one particular practice to my attention and said that he practices on a regular basis. And you know what the practice is called? It's called a death meditation. 
And we're like, Dustin, you practice a death meditation? Like, really? Uh, But as we started thinking about it and talking about it more, I think it's profound. And I think it is directly related to what Jesus is trying to point us towards in these verses. And, And this one practice in particular is striking to me. And I want to read the description of it for you, and then I'm actually have a, a printout of it if you want to take one home to do it yourself on your own um, time. I wasn't going to force you all to do it together this morning. Uh, I'll let you decide to do a death meditation if you would like. Um, but here's what it says. It says, all spiritual traditions remind us that death is an unavoidable part of our life. And contemplating our own mortality can help bring a sense of urgency, a sense of perspective, and a sense of gratitude. St. Benedict famously said, keep death before your eyes. Like all fears, the fear of death grows in the shadows. Death is the ultimate reminder of the impermanence and the ephemerality of all life. It can help us remember that there are no days to waste and that every moment matters. One of my... Maybe my wife's favorite poet, Mary Oliver, uh, wrote a poem that has become kind of famous, and it's a beautiful poem about, about a summer day. And I love the last part of this poem, just the last three lines I want to read for you as we close. She says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Life's fragility does demand an urgency, and this week, as I've just reflected on the fragility of, of, of our lives and all that's going on around us, it, it really has compelled me to want to think more deeply about what matters in my life, what my values are, what I really want to spend my time focusing on. This whole pandemic has really just changed my perspective on a lot of things and, and helped me to see that some of the things I cared about before just don't matter so much, and we don't need to worry so much about it. And so I think that, that hopefully this message can resonate with you and you can do some work in your own soul, in your own life, 